Happy New Year! Welcome to the debut episode of 2014 Nerdgasm. I am your host, Dave Canfield, and with me is Peppercorn Mont... Montgomery. That's right. Now, we usually have a third uh, ghost tonight, but um, he's uh, running away from a 300-foot guinea pig at the moment, so he won't be available. Uh, tonight, we are discussing the holy grail of nerddom, a film that it was such an influence that it took what would have been cool kids and turn them into nerds. See, my childhood would have been entirely different without this film, this whole series of films, but unfortunately destroyed me. I'm sitting here with my... So it's Star Wars Falls, you're a nerd. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Uh, also, your, your uh, awful influence made me more of a nerd as well. Here, I'm, I'm talking about... I do what good I can. And here's my speeder bike, circa, what, 1984? 83. No, but we got this a little bit later. You know, these things didn't come out right away. You know, you'd press on the back of this, it would fly up, but this thing's falling apart now. <laughs> what are you going to do? We're, you play with we're your gonna, toys too rough, that happens. <laughs> we're going to discuss the original trilogy in depth. Uh, we, we've got an exceptionally special guest tonight. Uh, Ethan Wiley, who is a filmmaker who got his start on Return of the Jedi. And uh, later tonight, we have, we're going to have a segment from our Nerd News Girl special this week and uh, some closing words with Jerry Har. But before we get into the dissection of uh, the Star Wars trilogy, I would like to bring on our first guest. Mr. Ethan Wiley, are you there? Am I here? Mr. <laughs> Wiley. It's an honor to have you on this show. I love your work from, from the first thing I've ever seen of yours. Now, well, thank you very much. Uh, you, like a Joe Dante, who's someone that, that you've worked with, uh, you're someone who fuses you know, comedy and horror, but uh, and that's one of the things that I admire you know, so much about you because that's the same type of uh, uh, genre bending that I do. Now, wait, that sounded funny. Uh, not gender bending, genre bending. Uh, you got your start. You know, the theme of the, the, the focus of the, of the show tonight, outside of your segment, is the original Star Wars trilogy. Uh, and you got your start on Return of the Jedi. Now, how does a kid, you were, you were like probably just turning 20, how, how exactly did you get involved in this film as a kid? Uh, well, I was uh, attending UCLA Theater and Film School, and uh, I got an opportunity to. Uh, get in the door sweeping the shop uh, at the monster, at the creature, uh, you know, department at uh, Lucasfilm or Industrial Light and Magic. And uh, so I literally started by, uh, you know, moving crates of uh, uh, creatures around and sweeping the floors and cleaning up the shop. And then they needed a, uh, they quickly suddenly needed someone to make Ewok feet. So that was my first... Uh, real job in the industry was I made Ewok feet. So somehow they, they saw the artistry and the way that you were sweeping the floors and like, we like the way that guy moves his hands. Yeah, exactly. He got some, was... Now, and from there, you, you, you were visiting set like a couple weeks? You, uh, you were pretty much on set for a couple weeks? Yeah, I mean, I, we, I made a bunch of Ewok feet and then someone had to deliver them to the set. And, uh, and so I threw a bunch of Ewok feet into the trunk of my car and drove to Northern California near Eureka, where they were filming up in the Redwood Forests uh, on some private land up there. And, uh, and so, I, yeah, I stayed on and became an Ewok wrangler. And I wrangled Ewoks uh, for several weeks up there. And that was my first, uh, first time on a real live Hollywood movie set. And uh, to this day, it's by far the biggest movie I've ever worked on. And what and does wrangling Ewoks entail? Wrangling Ewoks entails, you know, getting them into their suits and keeping them comfortable. Um, we had special battery-powered uh, blow dryers that had a heat setting, but they also had just an air setting. And so, like, when the Ewoks were in their full costumes, if you've, you know, if you've ever done creature work, you know that it gets incredibly hot in these costumes almost immediately. And... And so we would, you know, be giving them water, and then if when they needed air, we would we would put these little, you know, mini hair dryers up to their mouths, and so you'd see these Ewoks, you know, suck <laughs> on these hair dryers. It was kind of a weird sight. And but, you you, uh, you don't have to touch on the rumored Ewok orgies behind the scenes. 
But now you're doing this a couple weeks and anything um, else, I mean, are you, were you there with only the second unit director or was it Marquin that was there as well? It was the second unit director whose name I'm blanking on. He was an, uh, an older British gentleman uh, who had been, you know, like David, Lee, uh, David Lean's first assistant director. And he's like um, advanced in age. He's like, well, now I'm dealing with little uh, cute teddy bears. <laughs> I was yeah, in yeah. Saudi Arabia, and now I'm doing this. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I was there for the blowing up of the bunker. And when they blew up the bunker, that I, you know, I thought an atom bomb had gone off. You know, it was great. <laughs> and uh, the funny thing I remember from one of the funny things I remember from my first day on the set was uh, there was an old Mexican guy, you know, doing the craft service and serving lunch out of a out of a you know uh, trailer there and first meal it was lobster and steak and it was just like you know champagne it was like the most amazing craft service lunch uh, imaginable and so I was like wow this is great like this is what you know hitting the big time is like and someone had to quickly correct me and go no 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 you missed the whole thing where they hired a local caterer the the crew literally like mutinied and told you know the producers they were walking off the set if they didn't get a new uh, caterer by you know Monday and they brought up the best guy from Los Angeles who'd been doing it for like thirty years and this is the big apology lunch. Oh, to the okay, crew. so so you missed the cheese and crackers uh, uh, section of the of the film, right? Yeah, and, and I learned it isn't lobster, it isn't surf and turf every day on the set. Now, the Ewoks that were cast, were, you talking, were we talking about children? Were we talking about um, uh, perhaps dwarves? Talking. Or, like, what was the, the, the casting? What, was it children or was it just grown people that were it's a in little a pituitary people. deficiency? Little people. Um, Warwick Davis uh, was. Oh, they flew uh, him out. He's a British actor, so they flew him out to, to do his scenes. He was like 14 years old at the time. He played the littlest Ewok. And we actually shot a whole storyline about his character that didn't end up in the final movie. Um, Tony Cox, uh, who's the star of one of my favorite movies of all time, Bad Santa, uh, was also there. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the who's who of little people uh, in Hollywood. Everybody was there, and it was great fun. But not um, Wee Man. Not Wee Man. But not Wee Man, no. Yeah, I have an incredible career of, of uh, working with little people and uh, Wee Man uh, was, uh, you know, the star of the last film I directed, Elf Man. Oh, trust and me, we're going we're to be getting to that. You have a long yeah. filmography. So moving along next, you had, um, well, first thing I wanted to touch on was that uh, you, you mentioned you were in college at the time of this. Now, like a Lucas, Lucas had a bunch of people in his graduating class or that he knew that went on to be successful in the industry. You know, whether it's Walter Murch and Randall Kleiser, who was his roommate, there was a lot of people that were successful. Uh, which is maybe because they helped each other out or just a fluke. Now, you likewise had a successful group of, of people that you went to school with. You went, your roommate was Fred Decker, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? That's right. The director of Monster Squad and uh, Night of the Creeps, which have now become cult classics. And you also knew uh, you went to school with Gregory Highland? Oh, wait, no. He made Highland. Wyden. Gregory, Gregory... Wyden. Wyden, okay, now, and you also came up with the tentative title for Highlander, which was Sort of Bad. Yeah, Sort of Bad. That was uh, one of my inside jokes with Greg. Um, and, and, which became, a, <laughs> in the back of your, uh, of your debut uh, film, was the title of a book that Roger Cobb wrote in that's, House. That's right, that's right. Next you're, up getting the, you're getting into the obscure trivia now. No, oh, I, I know your, I know my stuff. I know my Ethan Wiley trivia. Now, also, uh, you were. I think the next was uh, Gremlins, or further, uh, very soon after Return of the Jedi. You were working with Crucial Wayless, the uh, yeah. the uh, effects master who went on to direct The Fly too. And how exactly did this Gremlins opportunity come about? Had you even been a puppeteer before this, or were they basically like you? You kind of convinced them, regardless of not having experience as a puppeteer. Well, uh, Chris Whalers had, had designed the Ewoks and other creatures for uh, Return of the Jedi. He did the melting Nazis in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. He did the close-up head for Dragon Slayer. And he'd done all this amazing, amazing work while he was at, at uh, Industrial Light Magic. And he wanted to start his own company and stay in Northern California. So I heard that he was looking for an assistant, you know, just uh, for this new startup company. And... Uh, 
And so I, I threw my hat in the ring, and we got along really well. And even though I didn't have a lot of experience, I think Chris liked my enthusiasm. And and also it was kind of more like that we were interested in talking about films and the stories and not just about the special effects. And that was one of the things I learned from Chris Whalers was, you know, uh, using special effects uh, to tell the story. And uh, he later went on to, you know, I, I left working with him and, and actually went to do House, but he won an Oscar for The Fly, which is a great example of where the special effects really meld with the character and the story. And, uh, and so, yeah, so I started as his assistant. We, uh, I quickly learned about the film business, and I spent a year unemployed as we tried to land our first gig. And we had a lot of close calls. We almost did uh, The Alien for uh, Starman um, in an earlier uh, stage of that. And then uh, Chris Whaler's old pal, Joe Dante, called him one day on the phone and said, look, we're going to do this tiny little low-budget horror film. D produced Spiel by Steven Spielberg. I guess he left Sp that out. That Spielberg was behind, yeah, but it was still going to be like a down-and-dirty, low-budget Halloween-type movie, uh, which Spielberg had a great you know, affection for and, and he wanted to do, you know, but he was now known as you know, the, the E.T. kind of guy and... And uh, and so he wanted to do a low budget horror thing. We have a picture and of you up on screen, by the way, uh, as a puppeteer in Gremlins. I think it's screen right, you with the uh, mustache. Uh, yeah. yeah, there you are. I see you with the mustache next to the woman. Uh, now you, you you had an interesting experience. I mean, most most of your puppeteering was uh, was Gizmo. Uh, I did a lot of the puppeteering for Gizmo and also for Stripe, um, and. Uh, and you know there were multiple operators on every puppet. Um, at that time, they were the you know it's kind of the most state of the art, most sophisticated animatronic puppets that had been done to that point, I guess. Um, and uh, and you know there was other uh, great things going on with Rick Baker and Rob Bottin and the fly, uh, the thing. Um, and you know around that same time, um, and you know it was a great time because. Rick Baker, Rob, Chris uh, Whalers, they all really collaborated and shared um, their their knowledge and their techniques and they helped each other out uh, and they were all kind of mentored by Dick Smith, the very famous uh, makeup artist who had had that same open source approach. You know, and wasn't was, Dick Smith also in Gremlins? You know, the I'm actor sure. Dick Smith versus the effects technician Dick Smith. Oh, you maybe mean Dick Miller. Oh, I'm such an idiot! Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> so now you also got to sit between uh, Phoebe and Kate's legs, which never hurts. Well, yeah, you know, a lot of times when you're underneath the sets, you're in these really awkward positions, and and uh, it was very physically challenging. But it wasn't quite so horrible when when Gizmo was sitting in Phoebe Kate's lap, and yeah, someone had to do the job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and from uh, from uh, Gremlins, actually, no, you later on went to. Uh, Collaborate on with the director of Gremlins, Joe, Joe Dante. Was that a project that you were prospectively going to write and collaborate on? Uh, was that a, a job that you had prospectively as a writer, or was he a producer? Like, what was what was uh, that film to be? Well, I remained, you know, I mean, uh, you know, friends with uh, Joe and his producer Mike Fennell, and uh, and they, by the way, you know, they were great to me on Gremlins. I would ask Joe if I could come and sit in at, in the editing room and just watch him edit. And he was like, no problem, come on in. And I would just sit in the back and watch him and Tina Hirsch edit the film. And and then later I, I sat in with Mark Mangini, who was doing the sound effects, uh, and would just sit and watch him editing sound. And uh, uh, Chris Columbus took took me out to dinner. I approached him on the set and said, hey, I want to be a screenwriter someday. And, and he, he took me out to dinner and Gave me the you know the the hard knock stories and, mm, and, and he says, everything. By the way, right now I'm writing Indiana Jones and the Monkey King. You can't believe what kind of crack Lucas is smoking. I can't. <laughs> you know, he was a draft yeah. of Indiana Jones and the Monkey King, and he had a, he's basically Lucas handed them this story about talking monkeys, and he's like, all right, I can try to make this work, and surprisingly, it never got made. Mm -hmm. uh, so from anyway, yeah, so <laughs> it was a great great experience. Everybody was really cool and. So you kept up the relationship, and then uh, after I had some success with the house movies, uh, I opted into script uh, to new uh, new line cinema that Joe and Mike were attached to produce, uh, and it's you know one of those things that was in development and never got never got to the green light. 
But uh, you, you that was the last time I did anything. Of a level directors all you know saw your work, liked your work, and it was a bunch of projects that almost happened, and then they go into limbo, which is unfortunately a story you hear too often. From yep. Gremlins, opens the door, oh, it somehow leads to house. Your roommate had the had uh, a, what a short treatment for a Twilight Zone esque kind of episode, and you said, "I want to take a crack at this," and somehow that led to the production on the second biggest grossing film in New World Pictures history. Uh, yeah, that's basically the story. Um, you know, sh uh, the producer, Sean Cunningham, had done the Friday the 13th movies, would have been very successful. Steve Miner had directed the two sequels up to that point, and uh, he really fell in love with the house script, and he also had an interest in comedy. You know, he later went on to direct uh, a lot of the top television comedies, like The Wonder Years and things like that. And uh, and so that that kind of uh, you know we shopped it around at the major studios. Nobody was interested. Um, Sean uh, funded the startup of the production with his uh, own money, and then we got New Line on board, and it went on to be become the, the biggest grossing film uh, in their history, and then only eclipsed by Steve Miner's next movie, Soul Man, a comedy. And um, how was the finished film different than the screenplay that you had written? You know, it's pretty close. Uh, it's been a long time, uh, but my memory is that they were pretty faithful to the script. You know, you always have to make compromises for um, various reasons. Um, but it, that, you know, that one got pretty close to uh, what was written on the screen. Sometimes there were budgetary limitations and things, but uh, yeah, it generally, you know, generally reflected the script. Yeah. When you, you know, you, you hear about your film, your first film going to production house, you're all excited. It's like a, it's a... The film in the millions and its budget, and then they tell you your lead character is going to be played by William Cat. Does, does, do you think to yourself, what? And then you, and then uh, to me, it's like a surprising bit of casting that actually works. But what was your first reaction hearing that William Cat would be the actor reading your lines? Well, I always liked him in the world's greatest hero or uh, whatever that TV show was. And, was it compatible, uh, like with what you had written in your mind? It, it, uh, I didn't really have any preconceptions about William Cat, you know, and so I was open to it. And you know, he turned out to be a good choice because he he has that he has a he seems like a solid dude, you know. Yeah. And 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 the film needed that kind of grounding in the midst of all the craziness. Um, and and so you know, because a lot of the other characters are pretty wacky, including George Wenton's character, and it needed someone to kind of play it straight. You know, and and he has some great comic moments as well. But uh, someone who you know, who you you believe is believing what's happening to him, and isn't winking at the camera. You know, <laughs> and and uh, so it, you know, it turned out to be a, you know a really good uh, choice. He and George went had great chemistry, and and they both loved the movie. They were very very thrilled with the results. Which leads to House Two, the second story. Now I'm assuming. Um the sometimes a uh, a franchise wants to get rid of the old blood and keep and, and find somebody cheaper, and I was <laughs> assuming that well, was the case. That's about right. <laughs> I was assuming that's the case with. I was trying to like sugarcoat it the best I could, but you know, you know, he had worked with Sean Cunningham. I worked with Steve Miner a number of times at that point. Steve's like, okay, I have to get minimum wage now, and you're like, screw you, man. You're not getting minimum wage. But there's you know, Ethan wrote the screenplay. What do you have to offer? How do you recall getting the, the job? How do you recall being you know, writer, director on the second one? Well, uh, you know, the, the, the reality is Steve had been pretty successful with those Friday the 13th, and he was not, not hurting. Um, and, and then, you know, everyone did really well with House. And he really just wanted to move on and do some new kinds of material and work with new people. And, uh, uh, and so it was, it was very amical parting of the ways um, and, uh, and so that left the chair open for me to step in and with my special effects background, that's really kind of what sealed the deal mm -hmm. is not only did I have that experience to work with special effects, but I brought in Chris Whalers to design creatures and Phil Tippett to do some, you know, animation and, and, you know, called in some favors and, uh, and, and, uh, the, the one thing on house two though, is that the decision to, to start the sequel came very late. And the script was written very quickly, and it was rushed into production, which I kind of regret, regretted afterward. But, you know, when the opportunity's there, you take it. Well, I, 
It's, it's too bad that the, the films that we work longer on, the films that we develop longer, tend not to be the films that you get the money for. It's only a matter of what's hot at this exact moment, and let's green light it. Armageddon right. came together on the basis of a title, and then like they tell the screenwriter, okay, you got like a month to write it. And you know, too often that's the case. Now, I can imagine the Caterpuppy was an absolute outgrowth of your puppeteering background. You know, you're probably thinking unique things. How, how, uh, what was the origin of how such a unique <laughs> little critter came out of your imagination? Uh, you know, that was actually a creature I designed when I was working for Chris Whalers, and I always thought it was a funny kind of concept. And, uh, and so when I was writing the script and, you know, thinking about what the, the different special effects and, and uh, you know, that there were these weird creatures in this kind of fantasy jungle... Uh, you know, we pulled the catter, we pulled the dust off the catter puppy, and, and what Chris was it designed Lewis. for? You just had some downtime at the studio between productions, and you're like, "How about this?" And then... uh, yeah, I mean, part of when I was, you know, part of working for Chris was also going to special effects school, and in the downtimes, you know, when we were working on whether it was Gremlins or something else, you know, he if we were waiting on a decision, you know, to come up from uh, Warner Brothers, and the production was stalled. Or that you know the the design phase was stalled, you know he'd he'd take us all to the aquarium in uh, San Francisco and and show us all the different uh, you know structural forms in nature and and you know to get inspiration from from nature, which is always the thing I liked about Chris's designs is they, they always had an element of oh, that almost looks like it could be a real thing, you know. Yeah, it's an uh, organic kind of starting point. Yeah, and and so. So, and then we would just do designs and come up with, uh, you know, different creature designs, and then he would critique them, and then we would do sculptures, uh, and same thing, he would come in and he'd, you know, make some suggestions of how you could reshape or reconceptualize what you're doing, and, and uh, so it was a little bit of schooling in there in, in addition to the hard work. I know you're a bit hard on the film. You know, my only real criticism of Faust too is that tonally it shifts. I don't care, and that's it. You know, okay, the beginning feels like a horror, the end feels like a horror, the mini, beginning, the middle feels like a comedy horror. That total yeah. inconsistency is the only thing that I think is a weakness about that film. Otherwise, it's a great comedy horror film. Really unique yeah. and a lot of fun. And Bill Towner character is, remains one of my favorite characters in any genre film that I've ever seen. And I wish you'd bring him back for something. Yeah. John well, Ratzenberger uh, is still out there. And kick him. Doing a lot of that's films. That's right. He's busy with Pixar. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know there was almost a house three, or the house three went in a different direction. They went to like slasher territory, uh, and then there was a bit of limbo for about 10 years where you were writing a lot of scripts, including scripts that were the basis of a, of a bidding war, like Stranger in Leadville. Stranger in Leadville was considered strongly by Tim Burton. Was he attached at one point as a director? Uh, he was, yeah. And at one point, I think Joe Dante was also attached. So, um, wow, Burton just, and, uh, and Dante. And yeah, it was a story that involved Elvis and exploding people. Am I not mistaken? That's exactly right. No, it was uh, it was the story of aliens landing in the Colorado Rockies in the late 1800s. Uh, it was kind of a reimagining of of of, of, uh, of the War of the Worlds if it had been a Western, or if H.G. Wells had written a Western, what would it look like? And that was kind of the concept behind the script. And um, and later, many, many years later, a, you know, a similar concept finally made it to the big screen, uh, Cowboys and Aliens, um, uh, which has a lot of similar elements. But, um, you know, that's one of the things you learn in Hollywood is that you can write a script, you can write a great script, you can write a hot script that gets a lot of attention and does great things for your career, but it doesn't necessarily make it to the big screen. And, and uh, all, all writers have horror stories about, you know, their favorite script that still sits on a shelf. Um, I was lucky in, the, in that they bought the script, so I was paid as if it had been made, which was, which was good for me personally, but it, it didn't help, you know, the, your career in the long run because you don't have a big movie, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, but I've, I've, got, I've got a pile of scripts. I've got a ton of scripts. Now, Jake but, and Joey, I've read some of your scripts, and Jake mm -hmm. and Joey's a great script. You never know if it'll hit the light of day. You know, and you, know, you can do quality stuff, and, you don't, and because of marketing reasons or what have you, it doesn't necessarily get a fair shake. Well, and, the constellations have to be aligned perfectly with movie stars, with the directors, with, frankly, you know, I think the thing that hurt Strange and Leadville was just the budget. Every time they would budget, Phil Rollins, who had been the, one of the, you know, the unit production manager on Gremlins, one day he 
we ran into each other at Warner Brothers, and he said, boy, you know, that script of yours, we just can't figure out a way to make the numbers work. It's so expensive. And this is the pre-digital days. You know, now it wouldn't be so daunting. Um, right, so now if, this script, if you had written the script at this point in time, there's no Cowboys and Aliens, they'd probably go in production so much faster because they figured they can take care of so many things digitally. Now, Elvis was in the script, was he not? Elvis right. was in which script? Oh, that was that was a, another script called Urban Legends. Oh, that's right, that's uh, right. Not, well, not, not the Urban Legends that uh, got released, but another uh, Urban Legends. It was and this I, comedy about urban about a reporter who runs into every urban legend imaginable in one long night. I am and sure it yes, would have been better than Elvis the Urban Legend. I'm sure it would have been better than the Urban Legend that was ultimately released. You get hired for. Sp- Spider-Man, which it w- went through a plethora of, a plethora, what the hell? It went through a whole series of writers and directors, Toby Hooper. And I was looking yesterday at the, uh, at the, the list of people who were writers and directors on it. There's like five, ten of each, including James yeah. Cameron. So you're, you're, I think, 1989 or so, you were involved with uh, writing of Spider-Man. And I believe you were given the restriction... Um, can you write this without any of the supervillains? Can you invent your own supervillain? And yeah. what, what was your supervillain like? The, you know, in, in a, you had to keep it true to the comic, but at the same time, you can't use the Green Goblin, Dr. Octopus, a Lizard, any of that. So who was your villain that you created for the script? Uh, that was the late 80s, right? It was Ronald Reagan, actually. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he was, it was 89. He's bent on destroying uh, Peter Parker, yeah. Wow. Because Peter Parker's family is poor, right? Remember that, <laughs> and and so he won't give them any, you know, financial, uh, you know, uh, support. And it really turns out it's Reagan is the reason that Spider-Man, you know, came to be. He was an actor. Uh, you could have gotten him. He was just out of office. Yeah. No, he... actually, no. Uh, yeah, it was uh, Spider-Man was an interesting situation that it was there was a very complex uh, legal situation with Spider-Man for many many years. Um, and uh, at that point in time, uh, the company only had the rights to the Spider-Man character and, and the storylines, but not the, the... It was a strange situation. Not the villains. I don't know why. They, they had the right to use story elements, but not the villains. Uh, but for some legal reason, they, they didn't... They, so I just came up with a, you know, a villain uh, very much in the line of the other ones and... and uh, you know, a, a mad doctor uh, in a wheelchair who's trying to regenerate his uh, legs through genetic experimentation. Things go awry. That was also the, uh, how Peter Parker gets uh, accidentally genetically fused, uh, or his genes get spliced with the spiders, and uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The camera came on after. Uh, this was going to be from the director of the original Captain America film made by Canon. This was going to be a Canon production. And I know how much you uh, love the original Captain America. <laughs> My co-host right here uh, has uh, uh, seen that film, and it's pretty amazing. So uh, maybe that's, that's a good thing that that never came into production. But you also had this terrific sequence with David Littleman, if I'm not mistaken, in your draft of the screenplay. Is that uh, true? Yeah, he goes on, on a, a, a show similar to the David Letterman show on, in, in my draft and, uh, and, and, and ends up severely injuring David Littleman accidentally. Uh, and, you know playing into the, the thing that, that uh, Spider-Man was always kind of on the wrong side, uh, vilified and believed to be an anti, you know, uh, a villain instead of a hero. Ultimately, but, uh, ultimately, you return to the director's chair in Children of the Corn 5, where you were the first director to cast Eva Mendez. And what was the studio reaction to the casting of Eva Mendez? Powers that be? Well, it was, uh, it was, uh, she was a total unknown, um, and she had never acted on film or or tape or anything before. Um, I don't know if I have the story exactly right, but she'd been kind of discovered walking down a street, and um, she was a student at Cal Fullerton or something, and um, or uh, Northridge, and she came in and she was very rough. I mean, she didn't have a lot of experience or technique, but um, but she had you know great personality and and was beautiful, obviously, and and I was really trying to get some um, ethnic diversity in the cast um, and uh, and so I kind of fought to keep get her in the cast because they the, the producers and the executives weren't that thrilled with her mm-hmm. and uh, and the rest is history because uh, she turned out to be a, a star you know 
Right. And you get to rub it in their face every time they said, why did you cast her? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah. This, uh, your next film, or oh, you, the, you get hired to do the Jason 10 closing theme music, the closing, uh, closing theme, for your uh, good friend who calls you up uh, asking for a musical recommendation. And your comment to him was... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, it was Jason X, not Jason 10, by the way. Get your X's and O's correct. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, yeah, a good friend of mine was directing the movie. Uh, he had first worked with Sean Cunningham, the producer on House 2, actually, where he was the effects supervisor. And he directed House 3. Uh, and so he'd had a long relationship with Sean. And uh, they desperately needed uh, music for their end credits, uh, and they were mixing the following week. They were doing their final mix, and so I happened to be a musician, among other things that I do, and, and he, he called me up kind of in a panic and said, who do you know that could quickly write some space rock music? And I said, well, the quickest way to do that is if I do it. And yeah, so yeah. I laid down the tracks with uh, uh, a guy I'd worked with uh, before, John Scholl, a great guitar player and musician. We rushed in the studio, laid down the tracks, sent them to Jim. He loved them, and we, sh we shipped them FedEx overnight, and they were cut into the movie a couple of days later. And um, what was I say? From, from Jason 10 to Jason X. Jason X 10, it's the same thing. It's a Roman numeral. Ten, oh. X means 10. You're just embarrassing yourself. No. Jason <laughs> so, X. The, uh, so you wanted to do a couple, of, a couple of super low budget films with Blackwater Valley Exorcism and Brutal. Brutal is the one that I think you know you hit your stride in terms of uh, uh, this kind of uh, budget filmmaking. Was the villain? I've asked you this before, and you've you have completely blown my question off. So I think there's something you're trying to hide here with this question. The villain reminds me of you in that film. You're like cool, like he, there's something about him. He's lower key, the way he looks a little bit. There's something about this villain that reminds me of you. Am I imagining things, or was that semi-conscious? Uh, it was not semi-conscious. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the the villain in Brutal um, is a, a, a serial killer, but also a kin uh, kindergarten teacher, and. Uh, and so, really, I, uh, I guess maybe I, I have the, the face of an everyman. Because that's <laughs> what I was... It's not so much like that. That actor, like, sort of reminds me of you, like, in his delivery, a little bit of, like, the way he looks, and his speech pattern, there's something there. You know, well, he's so. very... He's really brilliant and funny, so maybe that... There's that, too. <laughs> no, uh, there's that. no, he, you know, I wanted, you know, it's, it, it, it seems like the serial killers, whenever they, like, Say so. What was this guy like? They're always like, you know, he was a very nice man. Uh, never mm. caused any trouble. He, you know, he it did was his a, job. You know, it was and, a very so. unique character. That's one of the things I like so much about the film. You also had Michael Berryman and Jeffrey Combs. Jeffrey Combs is also in your follow-up film, Elf Man. How does the director of comedy horror films and horror wind up directing a family film about Christmas? Um, because that's what the market demanded. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, that is the honest answer. Well, you know, uh, I started my own production company uh, in around 2006 uh, with the idea of doing independent, low-budget films where I could actually get those films made um, and they wouldn't sit on a shelf at a big studio. And, and so um, the first two Blackwater movies, Blackwater Valley uh, Exorcism, and the other film was actually called Blackwater Valley Serial Killer. Until it was uh, renamed Brutal. Yeah. And it was renamed, yeah, in some territories they kept the old name, but... Uh, so there's some crossover of a couple of the characters and things in those two movies. Uh, and I was hoping to do, you know, a, a trilogy or more of all the weird things that happen in Blackwater Valley, but... <laughs> That's uh, not going to happen with Barnold's, my friend. <laughs> well, yeah, but, and then, ultimately, you are taking on a film that is filmed in China, uh, co-written by your uh, longtime collaborator from years back, Another master of the craft, Chris Wallace. You guys are taking on the uh, Yaren in a film that you shot in China. That's right. How exactly did you wind up uh, direct, writing and directing Chinese Bigfoot? Uh, that's a good question. I still don't quite know how that happened, but uh, it somehow it did. And um, yeah, I, I went over to China with a monkey suit and went up into the mountains and made a film up there. Um, but uh, it really was from Chris Wayla's original kind of concept, 
um, because he's an expert in the world's myths and legends and things. When I had an opportunity to do something in China, he was the first phone call I made was to Chris to say, hey, you know, what, is there some kind of Chinese story you've always wanted to tell? Because I didn't have a Chinese story I wanted to tell. And he said, the Yeren is the most interesting of all the world's Bigfoot legends, uh, mostly because there's actual evidence of giant monkeys uh, in the same region where people have been supposedly seeing the Yaren for 800 years. Um, and so it has, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, scientific backing. Um, and, uh, and so we filmed in the actual mountains where it supposedly exists. And uh, I, of course, you know, kind of, uh, you know, interviewed all the experts and we had experts advising on the film. One of them actually is star stars in the movie. Uh, as a policeman, and, and it was a great guy. And uh, and at one point, we were in a remote area, uh, and in a muddy pond, we saw footsteps that I can't explain to this day. Wow. And yeah. and you said that one of the children that uh, was auditioning for the film knew exactly what this was, because it you know showing you how big of a of a legend it is there. Yeah, it's interesting. Since making the movie, uh, it was starred an eleven year old Chinese boy. Um, who spoke English and is a great actor. He really carries the movie. He's fantastic. Uh, but when I came back home, I started talking to friends who have kids around the same age, and they all know who, who the Yaren is. And one, one uh, friend said, oh, you know, hey, uh, Ethan was uh, just in China making a movie about the Bigfoot over there. And the little kid was, oh, yeah, well, does he know that Yaren means wild man in China? I mean, he knew all the details about it, so it was, it was crazy. Um, so I think yeah, it's a it's a family kind of adventure film and and geared toward a younger audience. Um, and now uh, you're likely on your way back to China. There's prospects to another film in the same region. Uh, yeah, I'm actually going back uh, to kind of complete the delivery of uh, Yaren and and talk to uh, my financiers over there about doing a uh, a new movie. Before you know it, you're going to be a Chinese citizen. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, it's a very exciting time uh, to make movies in China. It's a growing industry over there. Unlike here, where it's sort of imploding out, out there, it's exploding. What do you think that the reason behind that is? I believe you said that uh, this, uh, how many movie theaters are being built a day out in China versus here? Where They're building down? 12 to 13 movie theaters per day in China right now. Full movie theaters. And they're looking for Western kind of movie, films with... Uh, Films with American um, influences, in a way. Well, it's not so much American content. It's more they're looking to the West and to Americans. Um, hey, we're having a so, microphone issue here. Uh, yeah, I'm a little having I'm having a little trouble hearing from the end. But anyway, um, so yeah, they're just looking to you know get filmmakers who have experience uh, since it's a relatively new fledgling industry there, working with special effects, um, creature effects. Uh, we were the first creature film in the history of uh, China. Now finally, you know, you're one, of the, um, you're one of the perfect guests for a show like this. I mean, you have such a body of work, and I've always admired you as a very unique voice in indie cinema, and I think you're underappreciated. I've, as I say, I loved your work from the first moment I set eyes on it. And well, thank you, it's, Dave. You know, it's not so romantic. I've, I've loved you from the first moment I set eyes on you. And, oh. But lastly, do you have any uh, encouraging words uh, for aspiring filmmakers? Be honest. No, no, no. 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 Lay, lay, it, lay it out as it truly is, because you tried to dissuade me at one point. I'm like, I'm not having it, but lay the honest-to-God argument against making movies in America. Um, well, you know, it's a tough time right now. Um, and um, it's uh, filmmaking is becoming very challenging. Uh, or it's an independent film to make a living, uh, make a proper living, um, which was easier in the 80s and 90s, frankly. Um, and there has been a great democratization of filmmaking that's taken place because of these low budget tools. But the distributors and the financiers now expect the films to be made for lower and lower and lower and lower and lower and lower budgets because they know they can be made for those budgets. Um, and it keeps their margins the same in, as, the, as the industry, you know, basically is in full-blown full collapse at the moment. Now, you don't see that in the large, you know, you read the statistics that, hey, the overall industry 
grossed more than it did last year, and that's probably true. But it's really a consolidation of power among the uh, major companies and the co new companies that are emerging, like Netflix and Amazon. But um, it's uh, it's not quite the you know free market that the independents hoped uh, hoped and dreamed of. It's getting uh, far and far more Darwinistic. <laughs> you know, to, it's going to be. It's, it's, well, it's getting more multi. It's getting more corporate. I mean, it it it, it uh, everybody now has a platform for their film, which is great. But that doesn't mean you have access to the main distribution, you know, channels uh, that can drive audiences to your film. So it's, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine who is uh, an expert in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, business on the internet said that having a website is like having a billboard in the jungle. And I don't know that having a, a YouTube video is any different. You know, it's uh, there's a lot of competition out there, um, and. Uh, and so, you know, but has it ever changed? I mean, when we were starting out, you know, in our early 20s, we just said, hey, we don't know if we'll ever make it in Hollywood or anything, but we're going to go out on the weekends and make a movie anyway. Um, and we would shoot films and short films, and that was with antiquated technology. So, um, you, know, you know, maybe on another level, it's always been the same, that you have to go out and do it, you know, and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and sc scrounge together uh, some money and... Surf on some couches and, and you know, get your vision uh, completed. And if it gets recognized, then you get a, you know, good things can happen. Ethan, you've been um, an amazing guest. And what you can't see is that I have a copy of Fangoria circa 1987 or 88 that you are in. Your picture is in it. Been on uh, your work for a very long time. Thank you so much for coming on this show. I can't wait to see uh, everything you're working on next. Uh, and I will talk to you soon enough. All right, thanks for having me, guys. Take care, have a great night. We have a special announcement that Peppercorn Montgomery will share with us. Big Bad Voodoo Daddy is coming to the Paramount Theater in Huntington, Long Island, New York, Saturday, January 18th at 8 p.m. And in Ravio's Got Your Tickets, click on the Win Now link right on the homepage to enter to win. Log on to ParamountNewYork.com for a complete listing of all the shows. Ad lib here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, ad lib, make, make something up. Um, ad lib. Uh, sure, glad to go to see that. Yes, so click ooh. on win now and you can win now. All right, so we're going to take a commercial break and when you come back, this is going to be all I Star guess this Wars related. Break is a surprise to our engineer. <laughs> <laughs> he just almost passed out. Surprise commercial. <laughs> we're gonna, and when we come back, we are going to delve so completely into Star Wars, your head is going to explode. We'll spend about two minutes politely discussing it.
and welcome back to Nerdgasm in our very special, heartfelt Star Wars episode. Um, if you'll sit back and go back a few years with me to the year 1977, where a young George Lucas released upon the world the first in what would be an epic trilogy, the first Star Wars. Later on, called A New Hope, that whole episode four New Hope thing was actually added on later on the videos. But um, yes, so huge release. This was what essentially was one of the first blockbusters of its day. I mean, you had Jaws in 75. Two years later, you had Star Wars, which was a huge release. Immense popularity. Changed filmmaking forever, and it's an amazing film. And um, so I think to get started tonight, we're going to go to our nerdgasm news girl and learn some uh, little interesting facts about it. If we're all ready for that. Are you ready for that, Dave? I'm ready. Bring it on. Okay, good. Everything I learned in life, I learned from Star Wars. Hi, I'm Anu. Here are some fun facts about the original Star Wars trilogy. This is a 1983 Kenner action figure of the uh, Vampire. What happened to me and why this this I like this, I think, is because I had one Star Wars toy when I was a little girl. <laughs> now all these years later, you're making up for it. I teach art and I have to draw from like Star Wars comic books. And... What's this amazing thing right here? That's when I met Mark Hamill. I went there thinking that I wouldn't be a complete fangirl. I got to tell him that I was in DB 516, a Star Wars club. And he wrote, made a heart with an arrow through it. Oh so. my god, Mark Hamill's <laughs> in love with you. You're a painter and this is your artwork here? Yeah. How long does it take you to paint something like of this magnitude? Oh, that one actually took me one day. Like, I like it to come together quickly while I'm having like one emotion about it. Do you listen to John Williams Star Wars music sometimes while you're painting? <laughs> I kind of um, do. Mark Hamill annoyed Alec Guinness so much that he paid him a dollar to leave him alone on the set. Your destiny lies along a different path from mine. What are these pictures from? The Smithsonian in DC. That's the father and that's the model. This I thought was spectacular. The detail of it was just gorgeous. I, I just always loved the costume. Here you go, now you can go to your first class in elementary school. In The Empire Strikes Back, Yoda was almost played by a monkey wearing a mask. People just think George Lucas lost his mind later years. He's always been a little bit crazy. <laughs> you can see Boba Fett's face without the helmet in Empire Strikes Back. Jeremy Bullock, who plays Boba Fett, also plays another role, Imperial Lieutenant Chekhov, who captures Princess Leia during her attempted escape on Bespin. Bullock is standing for in for the original actor, who was unavailable at the last minute. You arrange your sand people in single file. To hide their numbers. When I get buried, I'm being frozen in carbonite. Have you looked into pricing for that? I'm gonna do that pose. You know how <laughs> awful your funeral would be? Like, if people see you looking like that? So, oh, this is Hey, get that crap out of here. Is carbonite a real thing to get frozen in? She's gonna be waiting a long time. She's gonna have to live to about like 500. That sounds expensive. Yeah, hey. her name is Anu, and her nickname, uh, her Star Wars nickname was Anu Solo. And I was saying, you should just go by the name of Anu Hope. <laughs> I got that one. Yeah, well, it's true. Anyway, so are we going to talk about these films? Hell yeah, we're going to talk been, about these we've been films. Okay, we've mentioned okay them now, it's, so Let's let me ask you right off the right off the bat, as we uh, as we go into it. Yes. What is your first experience? What was the first time you saw Star Wars, and what was it like? Walk well, me through as that. I vividly remember seeing Star Wars for the first time, when my parents took my older sisters and I to the drive-in to watch it, um, when it first came out, and I was four months old, sitting in my car seat. Um, I remember just staring up, at, oh wait, no, I, as my parents told me, I fell asleep. I, I don't remember the first time I saw Star Wars because it was just one of those things that was always there. Like I remember watching Star Wars from the very first moment, you know, the first movie memory I have is from watching Star Wars over and over again. I mean, it's one of like the five films from my childhood I watched over and over again. Um, that, the original Godzilla, um, Flash Gordon and uh, Space Hunters Beyond the Fin. So there's a couple other ones. Did you say Flash Gordon? Flash Gordon, yes. The 1980s version, Flash Gordon. I must have seen that. That's another one I've seen a hundred times. 
Wow. Which is a great movie, and we'll talk about it another time. <laughs> you might, but Star Wars, you might yes. need treatment after that, but I mean, go on. There are people that debate that Flash Gordon might be a better movie than Star Wars. We won't get into it today, but there are people who I would who like to meet those people. Yes. I think they're in straitjackets. Well, Star Wars is certainly the more successful and um, endearing film through the years. Um, no, Star Wars was is the, the classic adventure um, sci-fi film. I mean, it's it's you have the good guys hitting the road to go save the princess with his old sage-like wizard friend, and they tangle up with some anti-heroes, and they go and save the day. I mean, it is the classic story, and it's just done with with a style and special effects that had not been done before, um, taking everything into a whole new realm. And for all the negative things that you could say about the movie, and there's not a ton of them, but it, it's really, I mean, it stands up for the most part through the years. You know, the characters all are amazingly charismatic and likable. So, I mean, it's just something that you want to watch over and over again. Um, and it's new, exciting. The villains are big and scary and imposing and still, you know, that's why it works. Just speaking, of course, of the original first Star Wars. Well, I found, you know, had George Lucas actually acquired the rights <coughs> to Flash Gordon, because that's what it was, that's what he was aiming for. After the success of right. American Graffiti and the failure of THX 1138. THX 1138 was a bleak sci-fi film that was very esoteric and European in its narrative, meaning that it, was, it wasn't point A to point B. Lucas was more of an experimental uh, filmmaker. He became a commercial filmmaker, but with a lot of this, the, uh, but with a lot of unique qualities. But had Lucas actually acquired the rights to Flash Gordon, would we be talking about it today? And the likelihood is no. It wouldn't have become the full cultural phenomenon. I think that Lucas was almost a little bit like Ulysses S. Grant in the Civil War, whereas he was a moderately successful businessman borderline mediocre that because of the circumstance of the war found himself thrust upon greatness and Lucas was somebody that was doing you know reasonably well and then because the rights of for Flash Gordon were tied up he created his, he created something fully on, a, on his own that captured everyone's imagination it shows you show, it shows you how interesting serendipity how 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 your life has to take a certain path. There there's almost has to be some fate you know, in your hand for you to land where you do. And Lucas, did, doing all this research on, on myths throughout time, the Joseph right. Campbell. I mean, Star Wars ties into so many, so many myths uh, and stories, so many things that are universal from the, be from the beginning of uh, storytelling. It seemed to have, a, it, it seemed, he seemed to tap into something that captured, I think, the interest of people who were into drama, people who were into sci-fi, people who were into fantasy, people who were into uh, romance, and, and people who loved special effects. He managed to get, he managed to fuse all of those different elements as well as anybody had ever done up until that point in time. Well, it was something very different, especially, you know, especially at the time of the 70s, where filmmaking had sort of gone in another direction, where a lot of filmmakers, you know, like the Scorseses of the world, were doing more character-driven stuff, interpersonal, um, you know, critiques of society and everything else. There was real stripped-down, bare-bones filmmaking. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on, gritty and stuff. This was, you know, the first Star Wars came out, it was polished. It was... It was, you know, he did a lot with what was a very small budget, even for its day. I think it was, what, seven million was the original budget for the original film, which was, you know, not much for compared to nowadays when they spent 150 million on the last one or more. Um, so I think it was, it was a whole change, change of program. And, um, and people were just excited to see it. I think people wanted to go out and see, especially at the end of, um, what do you call it? At the end of uh, the 70s, people needed something to feel hopeful about. Right, and coming out of the Vietnam War. Thank you for the war. You know, and you know, movies like Easy Rider, I mean, even Silent Running was a sci-fi film. It was like kind of bleak. It was, it was a yeah. G-rated film. It was kind of bleak. And even though that was an influence, but that was the frame of reference. And suddenly, even though this is a film that has a lot of dark elements, and let's be honest, it's not just 
all happy-go-lucky. It's pretty dark. It's a pretty dark film in its own way, well, but there's a hopefulness. There was a hopefulness to it. Yes. Do you know that Star Wars, and I don't understand this, when it was rated by the MPAA was almost rated G, and they felt that, the producers felt that that would have been, uh, kids would have felt that it was uncool to see Star Wars, so they kind of lobbied <laughs> for a PG rating. They do that a lot nowadays with the rating system. They play with things to get yeah. higher and lower or, or ratings. Or lower, right. You know, make sure it's PG-13. can't be PG. You know. so, yeah. It uh, won't be cool if it's PG. It's got to be PG-13. I don't understand how Star Wars could be perceived as a PG, as a G-rated film anyway. There's deaths in this film. There's, but it's there's, pretty... But based on the, the sort of unwritten guidelines that they go by, there's, there's no blood. There's no cursing in anything. Um... There's, I mean, there's a kiss on the lips, which is very brief. Um, that's about it. There's no sexuality is barely referenced. Well, how they even taped down her boobs so they wouldn't uh, jiggle in space. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there was, I mean, this is as clean and as, you know, a film as you're going to get. Even though they blow up a freaking planet. There's yeah, millions you don't really of deaths. See anyone. <laughs> millions of deaths. It's if there a was a cutscene that had you know, seen the laser come down and then blow up, you know. Well, we talked about like you know the new super, Superman movie, like you know having carnage that you don't see on screen. The same thing can be said about Alderaan blowing up with millions oh, yeah. of people Absolutely. on it. I mean, this this movie has an enormous body count when you really think about it. I mean, there's an entire planet of what this. Six billion people on Earth, so imagine about the same amount of people on Alderaan. Right. They blow up the Death Star, which has to have at least a staff of 30, um, none of whom can shoot and hit anything. Right. Well, one, one thing that I observed in re-watching um, re the series was um, how well directed A New Hope is. You know, in this modern day of Lucas feeling limitless and how he can stage a scene, and actually he seems more limited. Because I was just even looking at the opening scene of A New Hope, where um, the evader is boarding the ship, and there's a yeah. bunch of different shots of just the rebels anticipating the arrival. Shots, uh, reaction shots eye, uh, of their eyes looking around. And in that little moment, where they, they build such suspense of what's to follow. It shows you kind of what a master is, of what, of what, what a master Lucas was in terms of uh, telling a story without words. And it reminds me of something <coughs> that I read in The Making of the Godfather. On Francis Ford Coppola's first cut of The Godfather, uh, the scene where Michael visits his father in the hospital was lacking something. And George Lucas said, "Is what you need are the point of view of Michael shots. And they didn't have them. They said, you can create them. After an actor's walked out of the frame, use the tail end of that clip where, that, where the frame is empty. Show Michael looking at blank, at empty corridors. And so he's realizing from what he sees that there's a danger. And there is, you know, Lucas's instinct being able to kind of get you into the eyes of the character into the situation without using dialogue to do so. That being said, I actually, I think the dialogue in A New Hope, in, in a New Hope which I think you are a little more negative on, I think a lot of it is pretty clever. Even, and I think that as a whole, it does deserve the best screenplay nomination that it received. Now, granted that this screenplay went through a lot of, uh, a lot of variations, oh, and I God, think yeah. that Lucas can be, you know, is a brilliant man, but also can be his own worst enemy. The first draft of this film felt something more akin to The Phantom Menace, which is, I think, part of the problem with The Phantom Menace, is that it's like Lucas said, well, I'm going to take two months and see what I come up with, whereas this one was two years in the making, that draft, redraft, right. everyone, you know, breathing down on his shoulders saying, I don't understand this, and Lucas honing it. And as much as that's a downside of the creative, or a frustrating part of the creative process, it's also a very uh, good part of the creative process. Well, I think, uh, you know, it, you, when you have people who are looking at this and feeling way, um, it goes two different ways. I mean, there's always the idea of that, you know, and you'll hear this from filmmakers or, or television writers, I know a few, um, you know, the infamous studio notes and stuff like this. And my friend, who, who's a writer, um, he says, you know, sometimes you get studio notes that you're like, this makes no sense at all. And, otherwise, and other times, it takes that third person perspective to say, why is this here? This doesn't, this doesn't make sense in the story. Can we lose it? It seems unnecessary. I wish someone had read, you know, Jar Jar Binks and be like, so they could have just at least brought up the question, like, doesn't this seem a little sort of racist? Do, you know, this character seems... Or just like, even annoying. <coughs> or, yeah. Above the racist element, he's damned annoying. <laughs> you know, and somebody, you know, somebody like uh, Gary Kurtz or Alan Ladd at the studio is saying, right. you know, uh, 
how could you convey this character and just right. make it more audience friendly? Yoda could have easily yeah. Yoda could have easily gone the direction of Jar Jar Bink had Lucas maybe directed A New Hope. I mean, directed Empire, Empire Strikes right, Back, yeah. and it was Kasdan and uh, the director of uh, Empire Strikes Back Every that person. also shaped you know that character into something yeah. being much stronger. And Lucas would admit that. With Jar Jar, it's pretty much full blown Lucas. Uh, and I think, to me, my it's it's hard to rank these films because they're all so special, and we also have a little bit of rose colored glasses. But in rewatching yeah. A New Hope, uh, I think that this the opening of the film all the way till when they arrive and leave the Death Star, I think is as good as any Star Wars film is. And I think sort of from that point when uh, uh, Ben Kenobi leaves the picture, it loses something, and it doesn't get me at the same <laughs> level again as an adult yeah. until the Death Star, uh, until the raid on the Death Star. Right. And, and you notice that the films, there was like blank structures and no music, and I think that the sequels, they, it's pretty much wall-to-wall -wall score. It is. it is. Well, I think one of the, the, the things is, and you were talking about this screenplay, this story is, um, of the actual movie that's it's made, is tight. It's a tight screenplay. Some of the dialogue, listen, if you have Alec Guinness and James Earl Jones and Peter Cushing doing your dialogue, it's going to work. And even Harrison Ford, to a certain extent, it's going to work. But there, there are lines that come out of other actors, um, some tertiary characters and secondary characters. Even Tony Daniels, by the way, does a fantastic job with C-3PO. It works. I mean, and that's, that's one of the reasons that this movie works is because the actors they put in those roles are one, they're going to do their job because they know how to do their job, and you're not going to tell them. If you tell them how to do it and they say, no, nah, I think it's different, you're probably going to acquiesce to their um, demands. And that's why it works. I mean, should it one best screenplay against something like Annie Hall and a Woody Allen picture? I, I'm going to say yes because there's, a lot, more, to say there's no. a lot more moving pieces. That's like the difference of, you know what? The Social Network won best score over Inception. Uh, which I think is night and day. You have a simplistic score versus a highly advanced score. I go with Star Wars. Star Wars is the inception in that equation, and uh, Social Network is the Andy Hall in that equation. I just think that there was, it was, it was a fuller expression. It was a fuller piece. You know, it was like a, a hundred-piece orchestra versus a five-piece orchestra. I feel is the difference between those two. But the thing is, I, I think. Ha just having a hundred-piece orchestra and just having a five-piece orchestra, what fit? What fit, and I think, you know, and in the, the case you're talking about in, as Inception versus The Social Network, I think the fact that Trent Reznor's name was on The Social Network as doing the score probably helped in that. And, you know, when you're looking through the ballot and you're voting and you see, oh, well, Trent Reznor, I like Trent Reznor, um, you're going to vote. I think that helps. But I think in, in this, the case that what works appropriately um, makes a difference in those certain situations. I mean, if you threw this an, a John Williams type score on a movie like Annie Hall. It's no matter how that good it is. That would be John, amazing. I want to see, be, Annie, it would be, I would see be Annie Hall and John Williams score. Grating and over the top, and it would be just like. Oh my God. I, 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 and you would, you would have killed all the finite work that some of the actors And are you doing. put Annie Hall's score on Star Wars and other. It would seem, other yeah, things. it would seem like. It would, <laughs> it would seem like if you've seen but those bad movies. Speaking of music, it was Steven Spielberg's suggestion that uh, George Lucas hit up. Uh, John Williams did the yes. score. So now if Lucas had never met Steven Spielberg and never had that suggestion and he never thought of John Williams, what would this film have been? It you would know? have been very different. Because I remember, I think Lucas even said in an interview, his original like, concept for the music was something very futuristic, techno-y, science fiction-y sounding, um, as opposed to, and John Williams was the one who came in and was like, no, no, you, you're making a space I, opera. I hear something conflicting on that. I think he wanted something grand and orchestral, going back to Korngold. Or someone Gold, probably in the Korngold, making. Korngold, right. Yeah. And, um, which reminds me, one of the things that I think. But the decision was made to go with the space opera. Right. And, but when Lucas, I think right. he wanted to use Holst and famous classical pieces of music and adapt them. You know, it was one of the ideas that he had. And well, I mean, they then more or less do that. You know, one of the great things about the Star Wars universe is, you know, what... I was looking at... Here's a weird analogy, but I'm going to make it anyway. Uh, I was watching uh, Fist, the Stallone movie from 78, uh, Joe Esterhaus's first movie, uh, screenplay. And I'm looking at this film, I'm like, what is pulling me out of this film? And I'm looking at it, it's because everything is so clean. None of the set... All of the set dressing looked like it was just built and fresh. And it looks like you're, look, you're looking at a set. Star Wars had that very... Uh, 
of that very strong uh, point of view of making a used universe where the paint jobs aren't fresh, the the androids are scratched up, the locations are real and gritty. Yeah. And and it gave it such, it, it made it feel real, more relatable. It made it feel like you were in some place three dimensional. Yeah. Well, the amazing thing they do is is they it's not only they do that which is fantastic, um, they mix it up. So like when you're on you know one of the you're on the Death Star and stuff, everything's very clean and, and tight and sort of neat, pressed. But when you're, you're on those, um, what do you call it, the Jawas, giant thingamajig that I don't remember the name of, um, yeah, everything's beat up and, and scratched up and you see the different levels. I mean, it's, it's clearly very deep. Lucas is a detail-minded director and it shows. And in this, this particular movie, it comes through in a good way. Um, Although I think his obsessiveness for details was something that caused a lot of the problems where eventually he lost, they took the film away from him editing wise because he was taking so long and nitpicking. And a lot of the argument people have about the special editions is now he's got his movies back and now he's once again, he's being detailing and nitpicking and adding yeah. things in that it's nobody It's amazing for a successful director how we can never settle. It's like, I, I, I just gotta keep yeah. you know, tweaking and adjusting it. Uh, I would like to bring Jerry Horror in on the phone um, just to join doing? the discussion. Hey, Jerry, uh, we're gonna bring you in for just like a little bit, get your thoughts, get your news, and then we're gonna finish because we haven't delved into Jedi, but please, if you wanna stay on the phone for the rest of the show, that'd be phenomenal. Because we're discussing the whole uh, series here. We're just finishing up talking about Star Wars A New Hope. What is your favorite and least favorite special edition to the <laughs> series? Um, because I think, you know, I mean, anybody who says it all doesn't work, I think is being dishonest. But clearly some stuff worked a lot better than other stuff. Okay, I'm, I'm 35, so my favorite thing about the special editions was going to midnight advance screenings with my father. And to me, uh, it really didn't matter about any do-backs or that nonsense. <laughs> it, it was the magic of being with my dad in the theater, getting to see these films the way they were meant to be seen, uh, as George Lucas, uh, you know, decided again. <laughs> Will there ever be a Star Wars The Final Cut? I don't know. I don't. It's a work in progress. It will be a work in progress for the next 300 years at this rate, because every edition there's been, especially since 97, he then updated it again for the VHS edition, he then updated it again for the DVD edition, and then he updated it once more for the Blu-ray edition. He can't well, stop tweaking it. Well, with the Peter Jackson it. edition or Guillermo del Toro edition, you'll be seeing that shortly in stores. Next, no, I'm kidding. I wouldn't be surprised. I honestly would not be surprised on the amazing. And I mean, that's one of the biggest. But he did. I mean, he did recently release on DVD the original theatrical cuts with none of the extra, which at least he he did that, so people can get their original cuts because. A lot of people are not big fans of the special edition, or complain about it a lot. It real, especially, and it didn't help that the prequels came after that, and all that happened. But well, I, I like, I love the fact that on the last Blu-ray uh, DVD edition that he added <coughs> he, the actual actor who played the Emperor into Empire Strikes Back. I think that's great, and he actually changed the dialogue a little bit, so it's more consistent with what followed. Uh, so well, I, I, I like I that. I think with a lot of these recuts, it's been one step forward and one step back. There's things that are good. Uh, you know, like Dave just said, and there's things that are bad, like Aiden Christensen at the end of Return of the Jedi. Yeah, yeah. But I, mean, it's, I just got to get this off my chest because I know people are going to be hungry for this. I was recently at a licensing show that we had over here in New York. We braved the bad weather. We went in. I did not know this. Uh, we were some of the first people to see Star Wars Rebels, which is going through the new show that is on Cartoon Network uh, next year. Well, actually, this year, excuse me, time is flying by. Uh, it's going to be launching fall 2014. We got to see the show. Um, there's going to be a great deal of, I guess, CGI work put into the starships. We're just going to call them starships for all intents and purposes. So what we saw was animatics with the traditional animation. has a very Batman the Animated Series style, but a little more refined. Um, for older Star Wars fans, uh, this takes place between uh, Episode 3 and 4, this is, this is the definitive Star Wars cartoon that I know Dave and I have been waiting for since we were kids. It took us until our 30s to get the thing, but I really have to say, uh, from what I've seen, I got to see the first two episodes, even with the animatics and the voiceover was a little rough and whatnot. It's terrific. 
it's it's terrific, and this is definitely um, this is the Star Wars cartoon that all the original trilogy fans and generation grew up with deserve. I really don't want to give much away. Uh, we've got a bunch of new villains. These are new characters. This is the beginning of the Rebel Alliance, and I think it's something that people are really going to dig. Wow. And do you also have, I don't know, I heard some rumor that you might have a little information about a prospective spin-off movie. Okay. Well, this is basically what happened, and this is 100% true. This is not a rumor. This is real. Uh, Lawrence Kasdan has penned the script for the Boba Fett movie. Um, it will be the first spin-off movie because market research has told, you know, Disney, I was going to say Lucasfilm, excuse me, they told Disney that uh, apparently the, the most viable option is to do a Boba Fett movie. As you know, there was 1313, which was being developed um, at LucasArts as the uh, Django Fett Boba Fett video game where you would play as the bounty hunter. Um, but yeah, the, the Boba Fett movie is is in works to be the first spinoff. Um, the but other if, one, if marketing is research, rumor, the other spinoff would be a Han Solo spinoff with Harrison Ford doing the narration and the younger actor playing the Han Solo character. Is that like a is that a given? Is that a go ahead or is that just a rumor? <sighs> that right now, the Boba Fett thing is a hundred percent true because Kazan turned it in, and they're talking about possible rewrites. So, you know, as we know, we all have friends that are writers and everybody's looking to polish that script. You know, they, they want to get their dirty little paws on it. Um, it's Boba Fett. Who wouldn't? I would, I would, I'm not even a writer. I'd rewrite the damn thing. So if marketing but, research said that the, uh, the most viable option for a spinoff was uh, for B. Arthur to reprise her role in the Star Wars Christmas special, I would believe that, that be the next film? Of course it would, because yeah. we're all talking about a big business here that's about making money. But they would have to make B. Arthur all CGI, or you know, replace well, her with Natalie Portman. The magic of special effects. Mm. B. Arthur is now alive here and with us, and she will never leave, forever. Um, <laughs> really, what I wanted to get across to you guys was the Star Wars Black toy line of an avid toy collector, which is the really cool versions of like the Kenner toys we grew up with. They are selling, they are selling like hotcakes. Um, Speaking of Boba Fett, if you find a Boba Fett in stores, you'll probably pay 7 to $10 for him, depending on where you are in the world. But the second it hits the shelf, it's going on the Internet between $35 and $55. This is the definitive Star Wars Kenner-like toys that we all wanted. They're more juiced up. They're more detailed. Star Wars Black is a testament, once again, to the original trilogy and the buying power of our sad generation. Well, you know, and let's see what happens when the J.J. Abrams uh, episode 7 comes out, which you know, obviously J.J. Abrams is far more influenced by the original trilogy, what we're talking about today, versus what followed. Jerry, I want to delve into Empire Strikes Back, and you are welcome to join the conversation, or you could just run off like a bitch. What do you want to do? Well, um, what I'm going to do is I might run off like a bitch, but I just want to say Empire Strikes Back, my favorite playset, um, the Hoth playset. I owned and I loved it. Mm, yeah, you know, I have a speeder bike here. I'm not sure if you can see it. I have a Return of the Jedi speeder bike. That was one of my, you know, favorite toys. Which I, this well, is that thing was awesome. Yeah, it's great. Okay, so and yeah, the speeder bike. Just to let everybody know, the speeder bike from Return of the Jedi is going to be the new ride at Disneyland in California. Yeah, yeah, here. So it's gonna be a virtual reality thing where you like, where it's like a moving, it's a movie screen. No, they've Friday. actually invented a speeder bike. Get it the hovers. Hell out it's of amazing. Here. It's it's they're gonna use this technology to make hoverboards by 2015. <laughs> well, so, because okay. Back to the Future 2 was dead on. Right, right. <laughs> so, Return of the Jedi has more of a, um, uh, so, so, so if we hear a click, we just know that you passed out because you're really high right now, Jerry. I am not high. Uh, and I will say I'm sorry to hear that, yes. Jerry. It's going to be all right. We'll send oh, you something. I would something. just like to congratulate the young man that you've had on the show all night. For the children of the corn, uh, series has gotten better with each subsequent film, so I'd like to thank you for contributing to that. This is true, yeah. All of the six, six was a step down from five, though, in my, in my personal opinion, but they did, like, they were, they were getting progressively, yeah, more than that. <laughs> uh, there, was, there was, like, eight. Uh, so, so, Jerry, thank you so much. Like, this is, you know, you, you got to tell everybody exactly what I was hoping you would tell them. You know, you were t imparting all this cool news to me, so. Believe me, um, 2015 is going to bring I mean, 2014, we're going to have some very interesting things. But 
the rollout that Disney's going to have, uh, just the way they're going to be handling it, and we spoke about licenses, they're going to be holding back certain things, but let me tell you something, they're really taking this seriously, and I think that is what the fans are going to appreciate most. I don't know whether it was ego, I don't know whether it was senility, but I felt that George Lucas took his own creation and bastardized it as much as you know he could. Well, he as I said, creator, it was, so it I, was I unfettered. Can't. It was unfettered Lucas, and he's a great. Uh, he's great when he when he's collaborating with others. Not as great when he has too much power. Uh, and, you know. yeah, and when he has a filter, I think he's one of those guys that works better as a filter. It's you know I talked to Winchell last week about Ghost Smashers, the Ghostbusters script. You know, Ramis and Reitman polished that up. Totally different movie. Great ideas, but had to be reeled back in. Speaking of being reeled back in, I'm going to go back into the crypt. Uh, it was a pleasure being on the show. I hope everybody goes out there and they watch uh, Star hey. Wars Rebels coming this fall, the Cartoon Network. It's going to be great. Hey. And uh, y'all kids be safe now. And Jerry, happy life day. Thank you. Finally, I have found another person who celebrates that Wookiee holiday. <laughs> Great. Uh, Great talking again. Can I just more say things. it? Let me just say it. May the force be with you always. Force Thanks, with you Jerry. Too. Yes, that You're was the a best. Star Trek reference. We miss you, Jer. Come on back, though. So now Empire have... Strikes Back. Yeah, you started. Quick, talk about it real fast. <laughs> Empire Strikes Back is, hands down, in my opinion, the best of all Star Wars things ever made. Probably because it was directed by George Lucas. Um, anyway, um, what do you call it? I love The Empire Strikes Back. It is in my top ten movies of all time. I can watch it over and over again. And it's actually, for some reason, um, even in the special editions, um, doesn't carry the taint of the prequels like New Hope does for me. I, I have problems watching New Hope now. Because um, every time they say a line, I just think of how it was ruined by the prequels. Anyway, that's not important now. But Empire Strikes Back is was not as actually successful when it came out. I mean, it still made a butt-ton of money, but um, when it came out, because it's, it's much darker. Well, there was an I'm interesting point that they brought up in the, uh, this book that I'm reading right now, believe it or not, the uh, complete making of Return of the Jedi. Reading. They felt that there wasn't a lot of return viewers because people were depressed by it, so they didn't yes. come back and see it three or four times like they had A New Hope. Right, but that's exactly why I loved it. I hate happy-go-lucky crap. I, yes, but um, no, because it shows depth. It shows... And it, it, it sinks in and makes you care about the characters and it moves things along and it has an element of realism. Um, I mean, there's still people f jumping thousands of feet and swinging laser swords and stuff, so it's not really realistic, but you know what I mean. Right. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that works so well about the film, and I'm torn, like, I feel loyal to A New Hope, to say that's my favorite. But let me, you know, Empire Strikes Back is definitely... New Hope definitely... is my second favorite, and they're very close, but... Uh, New Hope is definitely, uh, I mean, uh, Empire Strikes Back is definitely, it's probably the best. I'm just not willing to admit it. It's the most consistent uh, of all of them. My friend said that, you know, back in college. It was watching Empire Strikes Back. It's the most consistent of the series. And he's dead right. There's yeah. not really stretches. Like, the stretches of all the other films where you're kind of, it's not as great. And right. this one, pretty much from beginning to end, other than a little bit of hokey dialogue on Hoth, winds up, you know, holding you. By the way, uh, I, I love the... Did you know that uh, Cloud City was a cut location from the original Star Wars film? That uh, Cloud City, then named Alderaan in the, in the uh, uh, fourth draft of Star Wars, was where Princess Leia was being held. So basically, all that stuff was moved from Cloud City to the Death Star. And Cloud City was removed from the script, and they held on to it for this location. Changed well, it's a cool it. concept for and right. a They couldn't cool afford it. You know, it, was a matter of, it was a matter of, keeping, yeah. uh, of cutting the budget on the, on the last film. And, um, you know, they drop into this, and it, you know, it works beautifully here. You know that uh, they froze Han Solo out of fear that he might not return for the next film, and they had the option in Return of the Jedi that they could write a version with and without him. But I'm just thinking, if they just left it hanging, that would that have been... Awful. That was like they said. Lando could have taken the position, done in the story what uh, what Han Solo did, and at one point, and in a way, he sort of does in some context in the flying the Millennium Falcon. I mean, the Millennium Falcon is you know, and the relationship between Han Solo and Millennium Falcon seems so entrenched. And then the whole second half of Jedi, it's someone else flying it. It's like you're watching someone have an affair. It's a little weird. It's a weird way to 
explain it. Anyway, um, that would have. Oh, well, how could they have awesome. done it? Like, oh, poor on, and never bring it up. You know, but one we'll of the take care of him after we take care of this empire stuff. Right. And then that would have been a whole new trilogy that he would have set up. Uh, I noticed which that, might have actually been. Then we would have probably had a new trilogy right after. A new Han trilogy. Uh, that's one of the things that I like so much been. more about the original trilogy that it had more of a central antagonist versus the prequels, which didn't really seem to have a central antagonist. It kept shifting. Is it Qui Gon? Is it Obi Wan? Is it Anakin? Uh, no. So uh, that's you know this knows its protagonist. And it's Luke. Yeah. Kasdan's dialogue in Empire Strikes Back, I think, is so. Uh, Retro in the best possible way. It's like Cary Grant, Clark Gable, you know, at, at its best. It is. It has an old Hollywood feel. That you know, it was so witty, and you know, obviously, Kazan was simultaneously working on uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and you can, you know, feel it. Mm -hmm. You know, feel that. Um, and by the way, you know, Ben Kenobi almost wasn't killed in uh, the original Star Wars film, and it was only before, like days before shooting where it was decided well your death is going to have a lot more impact because otherwise you're just hanging around in the last act you know not doing much so lucas had to create a, a new mentor for for luke luke lucas that's interesting uh, for uh for luke and and that was uh you know he came up with yoda so like the the influence was from the old fables a frog at the side of the road that winds up being much more uh powerful than you might anticipate but what would empire strikes back have been like if it was Ben Kenobi in the same mentor role, it would have been like it would have been a different film. It would have been very different. Um, I think it still could have worked, only for the sense that having Alec Guinness back, it still would have. I mean, he's just so good. No Dagobah, you know, like a lot yeah, of that's that would, part of it would have been less mythical. Less, I mean, unless yeah, there's a lot. Of, I mean, it would have been very different. I think it still could have worked, but I mean, I liked. You have to wonder if it would out. work on the same level, you know. Literally. Yeah, well, it's hard. I mean. I'm Listen, anytime you talk about, about a movie, what could have been, what could be, the, you go on for hours, days, centuries. Let's move on to Return of the Jedi, because we've got like three or so minutes left. We're only going to dedicate three Explosions. minutes. Explosions! That's what I, everyone I, wants. I like Return of the Jedi, but definitely the special. Like I, I love Return of the Jedi. Okay, this is the way I look at this series. I'm going to give, maybe know. maybe because I'm biased, I'm going to give the original Star Wars a 10 out of 10. I'm going to give Empire Strikes Back a 10 out of 10. And Return of the Jedi, I'm still going to give a 9 to, a solid 9 out of 10. Despite, can you tell, Luke? Is that who you could tell? Despite some awkward line reads that are in the film uh, and the fact that Carrie Fisher apparently was high the entire time she shot it. In, Rumors it, she was high the whole time. <laughs> she admits it. She wrote in Wishful Drinking that she was high. Like she was not really with it uh, at the moment. She, she said that was a bad period of her life in terms of what she was dealing with. She was a young star that got, had fame thrust upon her, and she dealt with it the Lindsay Lohan the Lindsay. Low hand was. So, you know, it happens. Uh, but there's a, there was a little story behind the scenes in the book where uh, they're rehearsing a, a scene with uh, where she slaps uh, Lando Calrissian, and in the rehearsal, she really smacks him. There's a transcript of this rehearsal, and he said, right. Don't do that again. And she didn't know any better because she's probably high out of her mind. You know? Yeah. You know, it was the, the downside of being a kid and being famous. You know, she was like in her, she was 19 going on 20. When yeah. she I mean, I out. really, really like Return of the Jedi. I mean, it is, um, I think it wraps up the series nicely. There's, there are a lot of nitpicky things you can go into. The, the Ewoks, nobody, you know, I think. But their feet were spectacular. Their feet were <laughs> amazing. Um, the Ewoks were, you know, they were what they were. Listen, when I was a kid, I loved the Ewoks. I mean, sure. let's be honest, for... You know, I think, what was I, six I think, years old? When I think out? kids like, six or seven. I liked Ewoks a lot more than kids yeah. like Gungans. They lived in a tree house, they hung out, you know, they ate, cooked and eat humans. Um, <laughs> well, that's true. Very yeah. likable. They really um, were cannibals when you think about it. They fought the, the Empire by themselves and only like three of them died. But, Which is actually funny because for some reason no one else in those series dies but they kill three Ewoks. If you look back at it. But this is true. This is true. We're going to be closing up. I'm going to say that Return of the Jedi is still a film I love, despite all its clunkiness, its awkwardness. Jedi Rocks is an awful... And if you don't like awful... it, just watch the prequels. you love it again. <laughs> Jedi Rocks is an awful addition to the special editions. I wish they stuck with what was there before. Not that, that what was there before was great. Oh. Uh, but the yeah. Jedi Rocks is embarrassing. But we have to, uh, what is the Jedi once Rocks? again... Uh, uh, the song at the end? That's right. Uh, no, the Jedi Rocks is in Jabba's palace, you know, with oh, these shy yeah. noodles coming at you in 3D, embarrassment like that. Oh yeah, I remember. <laughs> so we have, we have an announcement, so... Big Bad Voodoo Daddy is coming to the Paramount Theater in Huntington, Long Island, New York. <coughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Saturday, that's not written on there. It's not. That's for the ad lib section. Uh, Saturday, January 18th at 8 p.m. And in Ravio's Got Your Tickets. Click on the Win Now link right on the homepage to enter to Win Now. Log on to ParamountNewYork.com for a complete listing of all the, t the shows and times of the shows. Um, don't read this. Oh. And, um, yes, yeah, so go on to Inravio and reg uh, try to win some tickets to Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. That sounds like it looks like a lot of fun. So th thank you so There'll much. There'll Ewoks for... in the show. That's right. Yeah, there's, the, it's going to be Rose and Ewok uh, is one of the... Uh, revenge. Right. It's going to be one of the things they do, on, they do during the program. Yes. So thank you so much for tuning in to uh, this episode of Nerdgasm. You know, to me, this was the reason that... Maybe I should never have seen Star Wars because I would have never wanted to be a filmmaker or an actor if I hadn't. Because this is the film that influenced me more than any other. And um, movies didn't make me want to be a filmmaker or an actor. They wanted me to want to be a Jedi. Well, that too. I could well, decide. Yeah. Did you want to be? Did you want to be Han Solo or did you want to be? <coughs> did you want to be Luke or Han Solo? Because I kept going back and forth. You don't know me very well. I wanted to be Darth Vader, of course. Wow. Oh, yeah, I was always, you I rooted the, you for the villains the Vader, all the time. You were the Darth Vader kid, like, from the commercial? That would have been you? That would have been me, totally. Every step of the way. I keep knocking on the table, and they keep telling me about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I always, that's one of the reasons I hate the uh, prequels. The villains are terrible. Oh, Count Dooku is pretty cool. You got a little Christopher Dooku. Lee. Dooku, you know? yes. Christopher Lee, fantastic. Love him to death. Um, don't care about Count Dooku. For sure, he was good. Darth Maul, by the way, people love Darth Maul. It's the same thing as Boba Fett. It's just it's a cool looking it's, character. It's just not even that really cool looking now. No. But uh, anyway, thank you so much for tuning in. Tune in next week. Darth we're going to be we're going to be dealing right. with the Dark Knight trilogy and maybe uh, just maybe Walking Dead as well. So thank you so much, and thank you and for our guests, Ethan Wiley, and uh, thank you for all tuning in. And we will see you soon. Roll credits. We are out.